Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I love going to live shows. I've been to a few live shows in the last couple of years. But unfortunately, it's gotten to the point now where it's almost impossible to get tickets to any show you want to see unless you're willing to pay just crazy prices. And there's a bunch of things that feed into that. But they've attempted to do things to try to make it easier to get tickets. But unfortunately, when there's only one entity that sells tickets to most of the shows, it's whatever they do is what you've got to deal with. So interestingly, Kevin sent me a note. So Steve, check out the article. Ticketmaster's Kafka-esque arbitration process is rigged say the lawyers, and uh, that's an interesting twist because a lot of people have been complaining about Ticketmaster's just methodology for selling tickets, but apparently when you buy tickets, you click that thing saying, I agree to the terms and conditions. Amongst the terms and conditions you agree to are, I will arbitrate any claims I have with Ticketmaster, and I'll use the process that they require. And the question always is, is, is that arbitration fair? I've mentioned before that if you and I agree to play a game if I get to pick the rules and where we play, I'm going to win. I'm going to, I, I, <laughs> trust me, because <laughs> that basically means I get to pick the game. So arbitration, in a way, can be described as a game. So um, Lewis Cam and Sophia Sami Ali wrote this and says that every ticket master purchase involves many of the same things. And it all happens when you go to buy the tickets. There's a checkbox where you agree to the terms of use. If a buyer took the time to actually read everything in that hyperlink, they'd see what has become Ticketmaster's tried and true defense, and that is boilerplate legalese requiring the buyer to forego their rights to file a lawsuit and instead resolve their claims through private arbitration. Now, that's common in a lot of fields, and that's that's not necessarily evil or anything, but Ticketmaster's arbitration clause repeatedly has been used to fend off scores of potential class action lawsuits against the ticket giant and its corporate parent, Live Nation. Now, a recent court filing by four customers alleged that the companies have recently rigged the arbitration process against ticket buyers. Arguments raised by a man in California, a woman in Ohio, and two residents of Florida saying that Ticketmaster quietly switched last year to an all-virtual expedited arbitration process that amounts to a Kafka-esque procedure. The process is handled by a recent startup that is an alternative dis dispute resolution, or ADR, and it stifles customers' due process rights by restricting evidence, prohibiting discovery, and allowing arbitrators to rule on multiple customers' claims at once without even holding hearings, according to the allegations. The changes are so unconscionable that the Federal Arbitration Act shouldn't apply, they say. And the Federal Arbitration Act is a law that got passed a long, long time ago that says that the courts should respect parties' agreements to arbitrate so long as they're substantially fair, something to that effect. And so arbitration exists in a lot of different venues. And arbitration can be fair. It just depends what kind of claims are being arbitrated, but more importantly, what the rules are for the arbitration. So if it's successful, the plaintiff's case, that is, they could advance their case toward getting class action status, potentially allowing hundreds of other fed-up ticket customers to join the lawsuit. And it could also provide a blueprint to get around Ticketmaster's seemingly ironclad arbitration clause for other pending class action complaints filed by customers who say they've been wronged by what they are alleging are Ticketmaster's monopolistic tactics, including a recent crop of cases filed by Miffed Taylor Swift fans. And I'm going to tell you something right now, that The Cure, the band The Cure from England, uh, is coming to America and touring for the first time in a few years. And I've seen them before. I love that band. I've seen them before, and I, I, I like the band a lot. So they announced they're going to come to uh, Detroit and play uh, outside of Detroit, a place called Pine Knob. And if you want tickets to see them at Pine Knob, they said, you, you sign up in a program weeks before the tickets go on sale. You sign up. And you get yourself into this group of people. And then they say what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, on the day the tickets go on sale, randomly choose people and let them buy tickets. And so you will be notified of when you can buy tickets. And so when you get notified, you can log on, you can buy tickets. And the implication is that the tickets are actually for sale. And so they tell you that, you know, stand by for your notification. So they said the tickets are going on sale, I believe it was a Wednesday. And they go, they're going on sale Wednesday morning, so watch your email. 
So Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock, I got the thing saying, congratulations, you've been chosen, you can go buy tickets. Click here, here's your code, do all this stuff. So I do all this stuff and I get there and it pops up with a map of, of the venue of Pine Knob. And it says, what tickets would you like? So I go down as far as I can and I, I try to find some front good you know, tickets towards the front because the ones up front have already been sold. And I, and I pick four tickets and I go, I want these four tickets. I click that and it goes, they've already been sold. Do you have any other tickets you'd like to buy? Well, I really don't care. So I back up a few rows and I go, these four. They go, those tickets have already been sold. So now I'm wondering to myself, okay, is the machine that I'm on logging onto the system and it's like behind the actual... So I go to the back row, which are supposedly still available. I go, I want four back here. They go, already been sold. Now, Pine Knob has a hill. They call it the lawn. You're sitting on the lawn, but the lawn is on a hill and you can sit, you can sit and watch the band or you can stand. But, but it's, it's general admission. It's just sit where you can on the grass. And there's a huge block of seats that are considered lawn seats. But they're general admission lawn seats. So I said, okay, I'll take four on the lawn. And it actually says, okay, and it gives you numbers. You know, lawn seats number 3154, 3155, 30. I go, fine, give me those. It goes, already been sold. What else do you want? I said, well, give me four lawn seats. Are any available? He goes, yes. Do you want these four lawn seats? I go, yes. I, I want these four lawn seats. Already been sold. Do you, do you want to buy anything else? And it kept doing it. No matter what I put in, it would say, those are available. Do you want them? Do you want them? I'd say, yes. Already been sold. Do you want anything else? Well, let me get this straight. I'm at Ticketmaster. You've only got one job. You've only got one product. You sell tickets. I want tickets. That's why I'm here. You told me I could come here and buy tickets. And yet you're telling me that no tickets are available. Because everything I click on, you say those have already been sold. Including the lawn seats. General admission. If the lawn seats are sold out, you've got nothing left to sell. You should shut the site down and say, sorry, sold out. I spoke to people who got notes at 11 o'clock like I did and got no tickets. I also spoke to people who got notices later, couldn't get tickets. And I have a friend I was talking to about this. She goes, oh, that's weird. She goes, a friend of mine got tickets. I said, really? When did she get the notice to buy tickets? She goes, let me ask her. She comes back and she goes, nine o'clock. So at nine o'clock in the morning, friend of a friend, and I, I believe this, by the way, I'm going to assume this is true. Nine o'clock in the morning, friend of a friend got the notice, jumped on and got tickets. I asked my friend, I said, can you ask where the tickets are? She's already did. I go, where, where were they? She goes, the lawn. I go, why'd she buy lawn seats? She goes, because the pavilion is already sold out. So when I got notified at 11 o'clock that there's seats available in the pavilion and seats available on the hill, and for those of you listening to the audio-only podcast, I'm simply shaking my head in a dramatic fashion. There were no tickets available at 11 o'clock. So I was going through the exercise of futility of punching in information, trying to buy things that weren't for sale. And so what Ticketmaster claimed in that process was that by doing this and limiting each real person to four tickets, it was going to keep the scalpers from buying up blocks of thousands of tickets and then just jacking the prices up. And if that's true, that's, that's great. I, I admire that. I, I respect that. But the bigger question I have is, why were they sending out notifications at 11 a.m. saying we've got tickets available when they don't? And the same complaint was made about Taylor Swift. The Taylor Swift tickets went on sale. They said the site crashed, but they said, and I wouldn't know because I didn't try to buy Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> but I heard that what happened was people logged on and they either couldn't get through or when they did get through and they said, would you like to buy tickets? The tickets weren't available. So why am I being offered tickets that aren't available? Wouldn't they say these tickets are available and then give you like a minute or two to say yes before offering to somebody else would wouldn't wouldn't that make sense you know so i don't know what their problems are but i can tell you that Ticketmaster's predecessors you go way back to the convenient ticket corporation or ctc where you had to go to customer service at like say hudson's 
or a kiosk at the mall or a travel agency and get tickets. There were issues there also, but if you got there early enough, at least you could get the tickets. You just had to drive someplace because the internet didn't exist yet. So yeah, I'm old. <laughs> I can tell you all about that show I saw where the police played in Ann Arbor and Joan Jett warmed up for him and I bought those tickets through CTC. But uh, a lawyer says Ticketmaster is a company that's been able to keep itself, if not bulletproof, largely unscathed. They have a very, very tough arbitration clause. That's the nut that people have been trying to crack for years, including this man's law firm, whose clients in a different case lost a key ruling in February when the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals deemed that Ticketmaster's arbitration clause was valid under the federal arbitration law and upheld the dismissal of a class action filed in 2020. However, the lawyer points out, Live Nation and Ticketmaster were using a different arbitration firm to handle disputes covered under that case. But the companies, which didn't respond to requests for comment, said in a court filing that there is nothing about the alternative dispute resolution company that's remotely substandard for the industry, let alone unconscionable. But I can tell you, and this actually has a lengthy article, I can tell you that quite often arbitration clauses not only say you are required to arbitrate your claim against us, but you must use this company. And they'll be an arbitration company. This company's out there to do arbitrations. But people say, well, Steve, what's so unfair about that if you're both using the same arbitration company? Well, there are some arbitration companies, for instance, that are paid by the company that's naming them. So in other words, a company that gets sued a lot says we want to arbitrate all our claims going forward. They'll go find an arbitration company and go, hey, look, we want to hire you guys. We're going to write into our contracts that people must arbitrate their claims against us with you. So if this company is paying all the bills for the arbitration and to keep that company in business on all these claims, who do you think they vote for most of the time? Who do they like more? And now, some people say, Steve, that might be human nature, but you can't prove it because there are people out there who are upstanding and ethical and will do what is right. What do you think will happen if they rule against the parent company too many times? What do you think? What do you think? And I've mentioned before, I've done some arbitrations in my career. And I can think of two examples, two examples, where I got really, really good results for my clients. If you say, Steve, you got great results for your clients, um, then arbitration is good, right? No, there was something different about both those arbitrations. And there were two separate occasions involving separate defendants who didn't know what I was up to, who said, Steve, your client signed an arbitration agreement and they have to arbitrate the claim with this one company. And I didn't like that one company. And I went to court. And when we got in this fight over this issue with the judge, I said, Your Honor, my client's got no problem arbitrating. We just want a fair arbitration. What's wrong with that? And I've had a judge actually look at a big corporate defendant and go, what is wrong with that? Why do you get to pick the arbitrator? And I, on two different occasions, two different occasions, had a defendant say, Your Honor, we don't have a problem with arbitrating with somebody else as long as it's fair. And both times where we got a neutral arbitrator, that is one that we agreed on that had not been picked before the case started, they ruled in favor of my client. And you might say, Steve, that just seems like a really weird coincidence, maybe. Uh, two cases, that's not exactly a broad sample. It might not be. It might not be. But I can tell you one other thing that would tend to support this. The Better Business Bureau, I've mentioned them before. The Better Business Bureau has a program where if you are a merchant, you can say, I want my claims to be arbitrated by the Better Business Bureau. And if somebody buys something from you and wants to come after you, you can offer to arbitrate with the Better Business Bureau. Or if you write it into your contract that it's required, you can force someone to do that. One of the car companies years ago, instead of setting up an arbitration with somebody else, said, hey, let's go to the Better Business Bureau. Everyone likes them, right? BBB, I and mean, most, most, most people think, hey, Better Business Bureau. I, I mean, people tell me all the time, I'm going to call the Better Business Bureau because I'm upset at somebody. They think the Better Business Bureau is neutral. The car company went to the Better Business Bureau and said, we'd like to arbitrate claims with you. And the BBB said, great, we've got this program of ADR we can do, alternative dispute resolution, arbitration. And uh, the car company said, well, we'd kind of like to write our own rules, sort of like the way that Mr. Leto always says that if I get to write the rules and pick the 
forum, I'll win. And they actually wrote their own rules. And they actually had their own rules for arbitration. So if your claim was arbitrated through the Better Business Bureau years ago, if you were simply complaining about a merchant, you would arbitrate under these rules. If you're complaining about that car company, you'd arbitrate under these rules. And what's funny about that is that kind of backfired on the car company because the car company would occasionally tell people that they had to arbitrate their claims. And I and a few other attorneys I know would go into court and say, Your Honor, it's not fair. They're trying to push us into an unfair arbitration. And the defense would always argue about that. And the judge would often look at us and go, What makes it unfair? And I'd say, Well, and I would attach the two sets of rules. Here are the rules for everybody else. Here's the rules for this one car company. Why do they have their own rules? <laughs> do you think they actually said make rules that are better for the consumer than these ones? No, 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 no. And there were rules in there that were slanted in favor of the manufacturer. And you wouldn't have spotted them unless you laid them out side by side with the other set of rules. And so, you know, <laughs> sometimes it pays to hire an attorney who digs around and figures this stuff out. So the story about the Ticketmaster situation is interesting. But like I said, right now, I mean, they're a monopoly. They, they control ticket sales. So when Bruce Springsteen announces a tour and Ticketmaster's selling tickets, they know they're going to sell the tickets out. And they, they can do anything they want with how they sell the tickets. And, you know, what's fair or what might rise to the level of a cause of action you can sue them for, I don't know. I can't sue them because I couldn't get my tickets that day. Although I was annoyed and, and pretty angry. But the weird problem with a monopoly is that you can't go final shop elsewhere. I can't shop elsewhere. They're the only game in town. So that's the sad part. If you followed the story at all about the cure, there were stories where people had bought tickets and the service fees were more than the face value of the tickets. So the ticket cost would be this, but the total cost would be this, and the upper portion is all service fees. And people were complaining. They were up in arms because Cure tickets sold out instantly, as we know. Many people didn't get them. And a few people got them noticed that the tickets were crazily priced. That is, they cost this much, even though the face value is this. And people were all over social media with it. And Robert Smith, the lead singer, <laughs> stepped in and said, I am so ashamed and embarrassed and saddened by what happened to our fans and after he made a few public statements about how sad and embarrassed he was, Ticketmaster stepped up and go, we'll give a refund of some of those service fees. And I think they kicked back something like 10 bucks a person. Uh, it may have been 10 bucks a ticket, but it was a drop in the bucket. Although for them, it would have added up if they got to keep it. So crazy story. Uh, Lewis Cam and Sophia, some of Ali wrote it. Kevin sent it. Thanks a lot, my friend Kevin. Ticketmaster's Kafka-esque arbitration process is rigged, according to lawyers who are trying to get around it. Questions or comments? Put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. No matter how tall the mountain is, it cannot block the sun.